afternoon, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all lines have been placed on a listen-only mode until we open for questions and answers. Also, today's conference is being recorded. If anyone has any objections, please disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Hank Henry. Sir, you may begin. Thank you. Um, hello. For those folks who don't know me, um, the uh, NRCS is East Regional Biologist located at the uh, NRCS Technical Center down in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today's webinar is going to be on the Golden Wing Warbler Ecology Guidelines for Creating Breeding Habitat for this imperiled songbird on forest lands. We have two presenters today. First, Dr. Jeff Larkin. He's a member of the biology faculty at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. He's been involved with ecology and conservation of Golden Wing Warbler since 94. Uh, he's conducted research and provided management recommendations for this songbird in Kentucky, New York, and Pennsylvania. In 2010, Dr. Maria Bockerman was hired by Dr. Larkin and the American Bird Conservancy to spearhead an effort to develop a science-based BMP for golden wing warblers, the breeding habitat and forest lands of Pennsylvania and Maryland. Before they start, Holly's got a, Holly Kirkendall of our staff's got a couple little housekeeping things to run through on how this will proceed, and then we'll let um, uh, Jeff and Maria get started. Holly? Thank you, Hank. And first of all, let me apologize for any of you that had difficulty getting into the audio portion of our call. I did have a typo on the announcement, and I do sincerely apologize for that error. Uh, in the meantime, uh, today's presentation will take place in just a few minutes, and at the end of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. And if you would like to ask your question of the presenters through the operator, then you'll use star one, and that will get her attention, and she will walk you through that process. Also, there's the option to use the question and answer block that I'm pointing to there on our screen. Uh, you just type in your question, and we'll uh, save those to the end of the presentation if they're of a technical matter and for the presenters to answer. Also today, there is a handout that's available to you. So if you'll go up <clears throat> to the three sheets of paper icon, uh, you'll be able to download the uh, summary handout for today's presentation. Uh, take a moment now and do that while I'm bringing up the content for our presenters. Uh, that will load momentarily, and at this point, I will turn it over to the presenters. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very encouraged to see the number of uh, participants on our screen attending today's webinar. Um, this has been uh, a long, uh, a long project. Uh, it seems seems like a long time anyway. We started this effort in 2010 to concentrate our efforts on golden wing warbler habitat associated with forest lands. Um, I want to stress that at the start that. Uh, the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group is in the process of developing a series of habitat uh, recommendations that uh, we'll touch on other uh, shrubland or early successional uh, habitat types the Golden Wing Warblers use. Certainly, many of the structural characteristics that we'll talk today, that specifically Maria will talk about today, um, can be and, and, and should be um, uh, pretty universal from the standpoint of what this species needs, uh, but again, it's uh, it's basically a forest land BMP that we'll be talking about today, and then also just starting out with some general ecology of the species for some of you who are unfamiliar with uh, with the golden wing warbler. Okay, so there's Mari and there's myself. Uh, more on that picture of me wearing the Golden Wing Warbler hat in uh, Columbia uh, from 2008 in a moment, uh, but uh, wanted you to, to get an idea of who we were and what we looked like, uh, connect a face with a, uh, with a voice. So here's the star of, the, of today's show. This is uh, both a male and female Golden Wing Warbler, male pictured on the right, uh, left of your screen. Males and females look pretty similar to each other. It's a small songbird. It's a neotropical migratory bird. It means it spends most of its time in uh, tropical environs uh, uh, far away from our cold winter weather. Um, females look pretty similar to males, except they're just a little bit muted in their colors, just a little bit duller. 
Currently, uh, so why is the golden wing warbler such a, a hot topic of, in the conservation world these days? So its numbers have been dropping uh, quite rapidly over the last several dec decades. And uh, recently in 2010, it was a uh, petition for listing under the Endangered Species Act that uh, petition uh, was viewed as, as having uh, warrant, and now it is uh, continuing through the uh, endangered species uh, process with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The image you see on the screen is uh, a map on the left of the uh, range distribution of the golden wing warbler, uh, both the summer range in blue, bluish gray, and the orange color going to be the wintering range. The picture on the right side of the screen is going to be typical um, breeding habitat. This is a, a photograph from uh, an area in north central Pennsylvania. You could also imagine sites having a little bit more uh, in the way of, of goldenrod or, or herbaceous cover of, with, within the same picture as being appropriate for golden wings. Um, the one thing we'll point out about that range map is um, pretty certain there's not a golden wing warbler one in all of Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Uh, it's just a, a former range map. And the golden wing warbler working group recently um, created a new updated version of the Golden Wing Warbler range map. This map is just to give you an idea of where the species historically was found. So as I mentioned previously, the species has been experiencing a pretty dramatic decrease since breeding bird survey data were collected in 1966. Somewhere about a uh, estimated is about 63% decrease in the number of uh, golden wing warblers we have uh, sharing eastern North America, upper Midwestern uh, U.S., southern Canada. And a lot of the decline that we're, that we're going to be talking about or that you'd see there is uh, occurring in the Appalachian subpopulation. Um, if we were just to look at how the species is doing within the Appalachians, uh, you, would, you would have a number that would be far greater than 60. 3%. Um, that, that is buffered by the population growth and expansion that you see on the top of the slide there in, uh, in Ontario and specifically in the, the upper Midwest of northern Minnesota and Manitoba and those areas. This is a map that was recently created as part of the Golden Wing Warbler Conservation Plan, part of um, Golden Wing Warbler Working Group's effort in the last, uh, oh, since 2008 to um, develop a, a plan that is essentially going to guide, uh, hopefully, the reversal of uh, this decline. The gray is uh, historic Golden Wing Warbler distribution as it relates to the species pre prior to 1990s. The purple was um, was the range that the species occurred uh, within when when the 90s came around, basically when I started first working with the species. And since that time, the the green uh, in the upper Midwest, southern Ontario, and the red polygons that you see for Appalachia really uh, depict the breeding distribution of the species. So you can see that we've had continued contraction, and now we have an actual separation between the upper Midwest, southern Ontario, and uh, Appalachian populations. One thing that I, I like to point out is that in a minute we're going to go through the um, potential causes for the decline. Uh, the one thing I want to point out while we have these maps up is that Something that we have to take into account, it's uh, absolutely imperative when we're talking about managing golden wing warbler for golden wing warblers, is a close relative and hybridization with that close relative, the blue wing warbler. And the blue wing warbler, uh, just as the golden wing warbler has been doing, has, has been expanding northward, and that expansion occurs uh, on the heels of golden wing warbler range expands from northward and westward. What is interesting about the Appalachian populations is where we have golden wing warblers throughout the Appalachians is uh, is basically in areas that have already um, 
been through this this blue wing warbler hybridization front. So the, the front has has passed uh, quite a while ago. Still, we have golden wing warblers occurring in that those particular landscapes. Um, that that's a big question mark as you get up into the uh, southern Ontario and upper Midwest where the blue wing warbler is currently uh, expanding. Once uh, that line passes through an area, such was the case in Appalachia, many areas that historically had golden wing warblers uh, became dominated and uh, exclusively uh, occupied by blue wing warblers. I'll give you a quick example of uh, another way to look at the decline of the species. The Pennsylvania uh, breeding bird atlas, the first breeding bird atlas, was conducted from 1984 to 1988. Basically, think about all these little pixels being distributed across the state. Um, volunteers uh, have four years to uh, basically identify every breeding species within each pixel. These are the pixels uh, in which uh, golden wing warblers were detected from 84 to 88. We recently completed the, the second breeding bird atlas for Pennsylvania. That data was collected from 2004 to 2008, and it really illustrates the drastic decline of the species within Pennsylvania, and you can see that difference. I'll go back up. Um, hopefully we can go back up. So there we are from 84 to 88, and a 63% reduction in the number of pixels or grid cells in which golden wing warblers were detected in. Interesting thing, and Mario will point this out when we when she gets into her part of the, of the talk, will be um, the fact that if you know anything uh, about Pennsylvania, that area that uh, has the pixels that kind of goes diagonal from the southwest to the northeast. That encompasses what's called the Allegheny Front in um, parts of the Pennsylvania Wilds in north central Pennsylvania, all the way over to uh, the Pocono regions. It's Pennsylvania's by far most forested portion of the state. So a little bit about the ecology of the species and, and put this uh, all into perspective when Mario starts talking about the actual habitat features that uh, we want to manage for, if we're interested in managing for golden wing warblers. She'll also be talking about the various uh, associated species, uh, both game and non-game, that uh, benefit. So vermivora, worm eater, uh, so uh, what the species uh, utilizes on its breeding grounds primarily is Lepidoptera, so butterfly and moth larvae. Um, it's a gleaner, and it gleans for these insects um, from all stretches of the canopy, uh, from low-level low shrub uh, cover all the way up to the, to the top of residual trees or, or mature, mature trees that might be dotted throughout its territory. So structurally, why it requires a, a, um, a diversity of what we would call microhabitats within a territory is driven by the fact that uh, that it accesses uh, resources from a variety of places. You'll also hear us uh, talk about uh, ground cover. Um, while it forages in the canopy and in the shrub layer, it's a ground nester. Uh, it typically has its nest associated with some form of herbaceous cover. Depending on where the species is found, uh, as far as within its geographic range, you can find it in areas that uh, have um, uh, sedge hummocks, such as what uh, John Confer studies in southeastern New York, where you have these red maple tussock swamps, uh, such as in the top right corner. Uh, they'll also use uh, goldenrod quite often as the substrate for their nests. And uh, sometimes it doesn't take much uh, goldenrod in a particular place. One of our strongest populations in Pennsylvania is in the north central part of the state in the Pennsylvania wilds and it's a it's a 
pretty xeric uh, community, poor soils on some of the sites that you find them in. And this uh, one nest in the bottom left is, is placed in a, a little patch of uh, herbaceous cover. That's all that, uh, that's, that's all that that bird needed. And that nest was successful. It was in a tangle of rubus and uh, a little bit of herbaceous cover. One of the issues associated with the species or one of the factors that drives the decline is the fact that, you know, unlike that robin that nests on your gutter like 18 times a summer, uh, the golden wing warbler shows up in mid-May. It's a single brooded. It's, uh, it's going to make one attempt. Uh, if it's successful, it's done. Uh, on to uh, the post-nesting uh, phase of the life cycle. If it fails early enough on, uh, they'll try a second attempt, uh, but uh, generally we'll have fewer uh, eggs in that clutch, um, and, and only uh, only if they have enough time to pull off a second nest would they ever attempt that. So it's uh, it's p particularly uh, vulnerable to any kind of activities that might occur within their um, breeding habitat during the breeding season. That's something to keep in mind when. Maria starts talking about uh, management, active management. So the species occurs from North Georgia all the way up to southern Manitoba, and so so obviously the types of plant communities that you find across that huge geographic range are not going to be the same. Uh, I went through a quick, I went through a, a quick bunch of uh, books that I pulled off my shelf associated with um, you know, bird you know, bird guides and, and atlases from various states and just pulled out some examples of the kinds of places that golden wing warblers had historically or still are uh, found to inhabit during the breeding season. And you can see that it's a, a quite a, a diverse group of, of habitat types from North Georgia all the way up to Manitoba. The um, historically, the species would have been found, oh, probably in places like beaver meadows and the edges of beaver, beaver meadows. This is John Comfer searching one of his plots in southeastern uh, New York. Uh, quite a bit uh, shrubbier uh, behind uh, Dr. Comfer there where it says beaver meadow. It's going to have a little bit higher amount of shrub cover back there, but certainly the areas he's, uh, he's looking in is, uh, is a territory, and you can see um, directly in front of Dr. Comfer, there's a, a large residual tree and a, uh, and a little shrub cover, so a little bit of patchiness that, that Mario will be talking about. It's a, it's a little bit more open than normal, but it can be that way if you have a small uh, herbaceous opening, such as uh, beaver uh, meadow complexes, perhaps surrounded by a, lots of forest edge. This is another one of uh, Dr. Comfer's sites. This is just a small red maple swamp forest, so you see a whole lot more uh, vertical structure in this particular view. Uh, they occur in uh, alder tamarack swamps in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. This again would have been some potential uh, historic habitats. Certainly, post-fire communities would have been important to golden wings uh, historically, and they are gaining momentum in certain states as far as using prescribed fire to manage for golden wing warblers. We're certainly doing that here in Pennsylvania. And Dr. Bueller uh, down in Tennessee has been studying the, the effects of prescribed fire on golden wings uh, in, in reclaimed mine lands. Insect damage. This is, uh, this is a little elevational band of... Uh, dying trees or dead trees uh, from a gypsy moth outbreak followed by a drought, so two years of gypsy moth in this image, followed by a year of severe drought, which uh, stressed those trees to the point of mortality. Uh, there's about a 1,000 acres beyond that ridge that's already been salvage, uh, salvaged that uh, exists in uh, early successional state, only about uh, one year post-salvage huge early successional complex there. Uh, historically, wind damage would have been important as well to the species. So I want you to be thinking about 
your habitats that you have available to you and, and how you can mimic some of these uh, more natural disturbances. So emulating natural disturbances is, is going to be something that we would, uh, we would hope you could be able to, to take into mind when you leave here. Uh, this is a tornado uh, path that uh, on the left-hand side that uh, is for Delaware State Forest, an area that we studied uh, in the development of our BMP uh, that did have golden wing warblers. Most of that tornado swath has gone through the successional stages and now is a little bit old for golden wings, but it certainly formed the backbone of uh, golden wing warbler numbers that have uh, moved into uh, adjacent timber harvests. We'll again, talk more about that in a bit. Now, the, the community that I guess would be the poster child of golden wing warbler habitat modern days, abandoned farmlands. Um, they can be, uh, they, they, they can be, um, quite populated with golden wing warblers. Uh, it may not be, um, the most suitable, uh, as habitat because, uh, it's typically occurring in more open landscapes. It's typically occurring at lower elevations. And we know that uh, these are the areas that typically have golden wing warbler populations replaced by blue wing warbler populations in the long run. Uh, Mario will specifically give you those metrics from a landscape scale perspective that you want to follow in making decisions on how these abandoned farmlands, uh, when, when it's appropriate to actually use this to this particular BMP and uh, other BMPs that the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group will have out soon uh, to manage uh, low elevation abandoned farmlands for golden wings. Clay and mined uh, edges, uh, certainly in Kentucky and Tennessee and even here in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, uh, species is associated with uh, mine lands. The thing to consider here, I'm going to try to use my little, uh oh, hold on. To try to use this pointer here. Uh, th this is going to be the area that golden wings would be inhabiting. Uh, not, not this kind of stuff way up here. This is far from the forest edge, uh, far from any mature forest. Uh, the studies we were doing in Kentucky with uh, Laura Patton and, and Dave Mayer, we found that it's about the first 100 meters of that mine land edge, or I'm sorry, 80 meters of that mine land forest interface that you want to manage for golden wing warblers. Which leaves a lot of other open lands for those of us that are um, also concerned with uh, grassland species as well. Uh, utility rights of ways. That's another modern day poster child for golden wing warbler habitat. Um, a lot of evidence suggesting that this, uh, these places as they exist are not the best habitats for, uh, golden wing warblers. Particularly nesting success can be, um, relatively low, uh, if not zero in some places. Uh, high amounts of predation occur in these places. And that's, you know, if you look at that, it's got a really hard edge, um, we also know that under current regulations or perceived regulations that uh, there's this big move to eradicate uh, all shrub and tree vegetation from underneath power lines, and that obviously has negative consequences for long-term persistence of golden wing warblers in, in those areas. It's going to be a challenge for folks to, to go out and, and work um, with utility uh, folks as well as landowners that have these adjacent to their properties and, and um, find ways to, to better manage areas adjacent to power line right of ways or, or any kind of utility right away. Uh, there's a lot of potential there if we do it right, for sure. And, and I ask you to just kind of think back of that slide a few moments ago and think about what that utility corridor looks like compared to the historic tornadoes that we know golden wing warblers would have used. And, you know, their tornado swaths are just a little bit dirtier. They're just... Uh, they just uh, don't have those hard edges associated with them. Uh, the damage kind of is diffuse as you go from the, the, the center of the tornado path to the to the edges. So you have a, a little bit more of a, a feathered, um, less abrupt edge, and a whole lot of mess in between there, right? 
taken uh, a lot of uh, efforts in public lands particularly, and it might be a great option for private landowners who only have, you know, they don't have 3,000 acres to manage. They have that 120-acre farm, and they uh, they want to go in there and continue to have early successional habitat on their properties. Uh, this is uh, certainly one way that it can be done. We have work, uh, ongoing work in Pennsylvania looking at uh, mechanical shrubland um, maintenance and enhancement of golden wing warbler habitat. But by and large, uh, there's no doubt that the lion's share of golden wing warbler habitat from here forward is going to come from timber harvest. It's going to come from uh, the timber industry and landowners, as well as agencies that uh, own or are responsible for managing large tracts of land, state forests, for example. Uh, it's going to it's going to come from those those places. Uh, forest management is going to be an incredible key to the, reversing the golden wing warbler dec decline. Um, how that management is done is uh, is what Mari is going to be talking about. The things that we need to be taking into account in order to, to have uh, timber harvests that are both uh, productive for the landowner or the manager, that meets the objectives from both an economic perspective but also is there to help sustain golden wing warbler populations and other early successional species, uh, woodcock and grouse, Appalachian cottontail, white-tailed deer, uh, just to name a few. A couple of points on what could be leading to decline. Um, you kind of have a hint that we're going to be talking about habitat. Many of you may be sitting there thinking, well, what's going on on the wintering grounds? And that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, we could do all we, we could possibly can here in North America where they spend about three months of their year. Uh, but uh, if uh, they head down to South America and Latin America where they spend the better part of eight months out of the year, uh, it's, uh, it's just not uh, going to work out no matter what we do here in the breeding grounds. Uh, 2008, and you saw that picture of me earlier wearing that golden wing hat that was uh, the result of a group of us being invited down to uh, Bogota, Colombia, and San Vicente to, to meet with the coffee and cacao industry, talk about songbird conservation, uh, learn about the coffee industry and the cacao industry, uh, learn what can be done on their end and what couldn't be done on their end. Uh, if we look at the return data from a huge range-wide breeding study that we've been doing uh, throughout eastern U.S. as well as up into the, the Midwest. If we look at, we banned uh, male golden wing warblers, and then uh, they have these unique bands on their legs. And then the next year, uh, we go back out to those same areas, and we try to recite them. If we look at the, those what we call return data, uh, we have an incredible number of individuals coming back uh, year after year um, to, uh, to nest in the same areas, which kind of hints to the fact that uh, at least for some of these populations, their wintering habitat must be still pretty good if uh, if they're able to uh, come back from, from South America and make that journey. So uh, wintering habitat, a, uh, we have a whole group of other conservationists that are working uh, to conserve wintering habitat, but it really looks like uh, it really looks like they're doing well in some places. In some landscapes, those landscapes that are a little bit more fragmented, a little less forest cover, uh, in addition to that blue wing warbler problem, we have um, uh, brown-headed uh, cowbird parasitism. It's uh, in, in a study in New York, it was found to, to not be a driving factor, but it certainly did contribute uh, to uh, reduce nesting success, or at least reduced uh, reproductive output. You heard me talking about this uh, golden wing warbler, blue wing warbler, this whole hybridization thing. If, if you're unfamiliar with uh, with that, here is the kind of the, the phenotypes or the plumage patterns that can result. The blue wing warbler are going to be in the top right hand corner. The golden wing warbler in the top left hand corner. If you have a pairing between a male and a female, golden wing and blue wing, or blue wing and golden wing, whatever direction. Um, you can get any of those hybrids in the bottom left. 
Uh, you can get bat crosses between pure parents and hybrids, and you can, you can get a lot of variation in what you see, including uh, Lawrence's warblers. So a lot of, uh, a lot of variation um, add a little bit of complexity into our work. We just couldn't go out there and listen for a golden wing warbler song. We actually had to make sure that if we documented a vermivora, we actually had to go and, and look and see what the plumage pattern was so that we could determine that, yeah, the data that we are providing or, or using to inform uh, our models uh, actually uh, were the result of golden wing warblers. Um, so huge, I stress that, huge factor we must consider when managing for habitat, uh, for golden wing warbler habitat, is the fact that um, blue wing warblers uh, historically can move into an area and displace uh, golden wing warblers in a matter of years. We had sites in Kentucky where we had golden wing warblers for four, uh, for, for two and a half years of the study. They were golden wing warbler only sites. Four years later, at the end of the study, uh, we had zero golden wing warblers left at those sites. It had totally been taken over by blue wing warblers. And that was on mine land habitat. So it uh, can happen pretty rapidly. By and large, most folks agree that uh, what's first and foremost uh, priority to stem the loss of, of the golden wing warbler and stop these declines is, is the fact that we, we lost a lot of uh, early successional habitat. We, we obviously had unnatural levels of early successional habitat at the turn of the 1900s with landscape clearing, but that's all, uh, that's all came back to mature forest in many cases. And if it's not mature forest, it's been developed or it's in, uh, it's still in, in agricultural development. So, um, habitat loss and the creation of habitat is, is going to be key. And then you have to take that added level of complexity there and make sure that you're making habitat in places that has minimal uh, potential to attract blue wing warblers. Uh, so there's, a few levels of complexity. Now, this is uh, Delaware State Forest data. This is in the Poconos, north, <coughs> northeastern part of the state of Pennsylvania. And this is typical, I would say, uh, across the state and in throughout much of the east, uh, in, our, in our forests of the east. And that is we have largely a very unevenly distributed, uh, in, uneven distribution of forest age classes um, in our landscape currently. You can see where golden wing, golden wing warblers would be I'm going to try this pointer thing again. Golden wing warblers, you know, they're going to be occupying this area here. Um, 20 years is exceptionally long uh, for golden wing warblers. We're talking more between like uh, 2 to 12 years, 13 years, you might have some birds hanging out. But you can see that these age classes are relatively poorly represented across this particular state forest, and it certainly is the case uh, for many areas. The key to this, uh, you know, to our whole our whole dilemma, really, and we think about this. Another species I work on quite a bit is uh, is the cerulean warbler, which is on the other end of the of the habitat, the forest management perspective uh, spectrum. So, uh, how do we how do we manage our forested landscapes, keeping in mind the needs of both early successional and late successional species? It all has to come down to, uh, you know, an, uh, a better distribution of the age classes that are required for the various species. So many researchers agree that the conservation of the species is going to come down to our ability to, to move with some speed while we still have some remnant populations in our Appalachian landscapes and in some of our areas of the Midwest that have already started to see declines in the species. Uh, we have this, uh, this incredible push to move uh, the distribution of habitats of, of age classes into, uh, into some younger age classes to, to get that distribution of age classes a little bit more evenly distributed. In 2010, uh, I'm going to hand this over to Maria and a couple slides here to, to get to the BMP. Uh, this is this is an important figure for you, though, uh, for sure. In 2010, a golden wing warbler working group got together in Cornell at Cornell, 
Um, it, can, uh, this meeting uh, was attended by folks from Canada and the U.S. and represented folks from the entire breeding distribution of the golden wing warbler. Those individuals at the meeting used the best available data, uh, broke up into groups where they could most inform where golden wing warbler conservation should be a priority. And those are those yellow uh, hashed polygons that you see spattered throughout the map. It's not that we're saying don't do habit early successional habitat work anywhere um, outside of that area, but from a golden wing warbler perspective, to get the most bang for our bucks, to ensure that the work is being done in an area at least within somewhat of a proximity to a to a current golden wing warbler breeding population, um, we encourage you to work within the yellow hashed areas and work out in kind of a concentric circle kind of a fashion. But of course, if you have some opportunities uh, elsewhere, if they meet the proper landscape and stand level characteristics, uh, we're not saying that you should not manage elsewhere. We're just saying this is a map that gives you the most likely uh, chances of success. Now, I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Uh, we're just going to look at two polygons for Pennsylvania. Um, A7 up there in the top left, a smaller purple circle. <clears throat> if we have these particular population goals, currently we have about 6,250 uh, 6, acres of early successional habitat spattered throughout that entire area. The goal is to double that acreage by 2050. Think about this. Early successional habitat is ephemeral. It's not going to, you know, if we manage 2,000 acres today, in 10 years it's not going to be early successional, at least at the age, uh, age class the golden wings are going to use. Uh, it'll be on its way out. So it's going to take a lot of landscape planning to keep populations uh, uh, persistent into the, into the long term. But nonetheless, if we're looking at a goal of 2,500 acres, um, then we want to see 2,500 birds, uh, hopefully in that area by 2050. So a goal of 2,000, uh, 12,500 will hopefully double that population uh, by the year 2050. In the much larger area, a 40, uh, a, a8. You can see that, uh, again, much larger area, huge, huge expansive area, 30,000 acres currently, a goal of doubling that acreage. Any one person would feel absolutely overwhelmed by that, but if we think about this as having multiple partners, state and private lands, this certainly is, uh, is doable. The key is going to be how you do it sustainably uh, over the long haul to make sure that you maintain these acres of habitats in our landscape. Uh-oh, <laughs> keep hitting the wrong button when I try to go down here. There we go. And finally, uh, in 2005, we created this guide that was uh, basically just a little pamphlet. That this is the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group. It created this guide that was to inform those folks that wanted to try to manage for Golden Wing Warblers on their properties uh, what, what they could do. And I always think it's interesting, you know, our last paragraph of this document uh, starts out with that underlying text. This is, many recommendations are generic and based on expert opinion until more detailed information becomes available. And that, uh, that is really 2005, that's really when the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group began building up its momentum. Uh, 2008 it was awarded uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funding to start a range-wide breeding habitat study. Um, several of us uh, we're able to find additional funding to enhance that work in, in our respective states and provinces. And uh, what Mari is about to talk about is uh, is a grant that we were able to, to build on uh, the initial work with uh, another National Fish and Wildlife Foundation grant awarded to American Bird Conservancy and IUP to uh, to create that lion's share of habitat that I talked about, that forest land habitat that uh, is going to be so important to golden wing warblers. That is, uh, that is where Mari entered the picture. That's when uh, Maria came over from Cerulean Warbler Forest Management uh, background and decided to work uh, into an uh, early successional realm. 
coming from uh, Ohio State, where she earned her Ph.D., and I'm going to turn this over to Maria now. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Hi, everybody out there. All right, so I'm going to continue today's talk, and I'll just keep moving along. I want to provide some, a short background in the development of the uh, BMP, the best management practices that uh, we're developing, and then I'll get right into some of the guidelines. But the goal, again, of this project was really to understand uh, what habitat breeding golden wing warblers used across a range of timber harvest prescriptions in Pennsylvania and Maryland, and then we characterize those stands used by golden wing warblers to present guidelines to forest managers interested in providing breeding habitat for golden wing warblers, okay, while instituting these timber harvests. And uh, we use past and current research to inform these guidelines, and we, we certainly anticipate that this BMP is the first in a series, as Jeff mentioned, that will address management of other early successions early successional habitats used by goldwing warblers. Okay, and right, right off the bat, I want to um, point out that although this BMP focuses on uh, the creation of habitat for goldwing warblers, these guidelines will, will certainly benefit a suite of species that depend on early successional habitat. Uh, many of these species, as you see pictured here, are experiencing population declines as well and are of high conservation concern. And in our surveys, we take that into account and document other species using these stands as well. Uh, these are not only uh, non-game, but also many game species as well, like you see there, the woodcock uh, and grouse and deer. So Jeff already uh, showed you uh, the Pennsylvania Breeding Bird Atlas maps. So I just want to put them side by side for you to view, uh, again, to highlight the areas of Pennsylvania where golden, golden wing warblers persist on the landscape, because this is where we also concentrated our research efforts. We really wanted to work in, the, in those strongholds uh, where golden wing warblers persist. And again, for, for Pennsylvania, uh, these areas correspond to the Appalachian Plateau and Ridge and Valley provinces, which are both characterized by not only high forest cover, but high elevation as well. Okay, so here you can see our map of Pennsylvania and Maryland, and those large circles indicate general study areas. Uh, we conducted surveys in timber harvest throughout uh, these study areas. In 2010, uh, we mainly focused in the north central area of Pennsylvania, working in one state forest there, in Sproul State Forest. And then in the northeast in 2010, we worked in Delaware State Forest over in the Poconos area. Then in 2011, we really uh, extended our surveys to include Southwest PA and Maryland. We uh, surveyed some state forests, but then we also added state game lands to all the regions in Pennsylvania as well. So we really expanded out uh, our survey efforts. Okay, in this slide, I just really want to highlight that we, again, surveyed a wide range of timber harvests. All of these harvests were created through regular operations, uh, and none were planted restorations. You can see here that the timber harvest varied in age, in size, in structural features. Uh, typically, foresters classified these types of stands as shelter woods or overstory removals, clear cuts, uh, but we did not limit the research to just these prescriptions. Okay, so in 2010 and 2011, we conducted both avian and habitat surveys. Uh, we conducted repeated point counts from about mid-May to mid-June. We recorded all golden wing warblers, blue wing warblers, and their hybrids. We also uh, recorded all species uh, within our point count surveys, too. As Jeff mentioned, we had to uh, visually confirm whether we saw a golden wing warbler or a blue wing warbler. Gold wing warbler again is shown in the upper left. Blue wing warbler on this slide is shown in the bottom left, and then one of their hybrids, uh, the Brewster's warbler, is shown in the on the bottom right there. Once point counts were completed, we collected habitat data associated with each one of those point counts. We collected a large number of habitat variables, not of um, I certainly didn't list all of them here for you today, but I wanted to know that we we based the 
the variables we collected on protocol developed by the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group so that researchers across the breeding range can compare results. Okay, so just one quick slide to show you some of our survey results. You can see that in both years we had almost 90 detections of Golden Wing Warblers. Uh, we did detect some of those hybrid Brewster Warblers uh, using these timber harvest stands. Uh, we only detected blue wing warblers in 2011, and we think that's really a result of sort of expanding our, our search out, including more stands with uh, greater variation in the landscape and forest cover as well. You can see, though, that only about 30% of the timber harvest stands that we surveyed, uh, actually, we detected golden wing warblers in those. And I also want to mention that we detected about 65 other species of birds uh, during point count surveys as well. Okay, so now I'm going to jump into the, the guidelines that we present uh, in our BMP, starting at the courses scale. And I want to mention that uh, the handout that's provided, uh, we kind of called the BMP basics. This is just sort of a summary uh, of these guidelines, so uh, you can consult that BMP basic. That is also what we hand out uh, at training sessions where we actually see people face to face. Uh, and focal areas are available for all states as well that we could uh, get those to you. But so with our guidelines, we started at the course of scale. So where should management for golden wing warblers occur? And as Jeff just mentioned, to be the most effective in golden wing warbler conservation, um, Core populations need to be maintained so that we can build out from these populations. So here, um, you know, core focal conservation areas have been identified throughout their breeding range, and here you can see the basic outline of those focal areas in Pennsylvania and Western Maryland. Okay, and as seen earlier in the population distribution map with the breeding bird atlas for Pennsylvania, and this occurs similarly uh, throughout the golden wing warblers range uh, in the Appalachians. Their distribution is influenced by the interplay of landscape scale forest cover, elevation, and then the absence of blue wing warblers. And so these really were some of the main factors used to identify those core focal areas in Pennsylvania and Maryland. So we recommend that at least 70% of the landscape within half a mile should be forested. And for, certainly for the Appalachians, where elevation comes into play, the elevation should be uh, 950 feet or higher. Now, of course, keep in mind that some elevations in these regions may still be appropriate for habitat management for golden warblers if high forest cover remains. Uh, again, the, the issue with elevation is that typically at lower elevations, the landscape opens up, whether that be for agricultural land use or urbanization, that then reduces the forest cover in the landscape, and these are the stands that blue wing warblers will move into and occupy and push golden wing warblers out. So that's why we, you really have to consider all these factors together. Okay, now where would a manager want to harvest timber to create golden wing warbler habitat? Well, one of the next things to consider are where are other young forest habitats. These may be created through disturbances, like Jeff mentioned, uh, tornadoes or insect damage or fires, or they may be uh, natural habitats that remain on the landscape, like forested wetlands or even timber harvests that have been created. Uh, but they're important to serve as source populations that can add individuals to these new stands of young forest you're creating. And we recommend that you cluster them within half a mile to a mile because patches will not be occupied and used if they're isolated. Uh, as Jeff always likes to say, these birds uh, want to be part of a party. They're not going to be out in a stand in the middle of nowhere. They're going to look for uh, clusters of stands on the landscape. They're social creatures, and they want to, they do not want to be isolated. And, of course, the key is to periodically create patches of young forest habitat of sufficient quantity and proximity to other patches so that the needed habitat is continuously available on the landscape. And here, in this slide, I'm illustrating, this is a tornado that went through Delaware State Forest. Uh, these stands were salvage logged. This stand does have golden wing warblers occupying that stand. Uh, these stands have 
little to no residual trees in there. There are no golden wing warblers in the stands outlined in red. But then not far away in the landscape are these timber harvests, okay, which also have golden wing warblers now occupying those stands. Another disturbance that you may consider are those created through energy development. As you can see on the, the left photo, uh, the well pads, the pipelines, the road margins, okay, these are carving up our forested landscapes. And by themselves, they're not good golden wing warbler habitat. But if they're reclaimed properly, and I'm going to talk about uh, reclaiming herbaceous cover properly in just a few minutes, if they're reclaimed properly and combined with forest management, within adjacent stands, then they may actually be able to supply some of those components like herbaceous cover that are necessary in golden wing warbler territories. So you can see in the illustration on the right um, a hypothetical forest management plan that places timber harvest between some of these uh, road margins and well pads that are left by the energy development. Okay, so those will, will maintain those, that herbaceous cover for golden wing warblers. And the bottom image on the left is actually uh, one of those shallow gas well pads that has a lot of structure, uh, trees retained, uh, some shrubs around it, and then some herbaceous cover where golden wing warblers uh, were occupying that area. So when will golden wing warblers uh, begin to use a timber harvest? Well, typically, uh, golden wing warblers will begin to use them about four to five years post-harvest. Uh, it just, those harvests typically need some time for that structure to regenerate until about 10 to 12 years post-harvest. And this, again, um, is when each land manager is the expert and they know the site quality because certainly some stands will be ready for golden wing warblers to use earlier and others um, may fall out at 10 years. But if site quality is low, you may have golden wing warblers occupying uh, those stands until maybe 12 years, maybe holding out in a log landing area using those spots uh, where herbaceous cover is retained. But again, this depends on site quality. These are just general uh, guidelines. Now, you'll hear me talk about the importance of canopy trees or forest edge throughout the rest of the talk. And remember that, well, canopy trees are important for golden wing warblers because uh, they use them as foraging, as we heard from, from Jeff but they also are weak singers, so they use them as singing perches as well. Those golden wings, those males have to get up there in those canopy trees uh, to really get their song uh, to spread across the stand. So they're weak singers and they really rely on these uh, mature canopy trees. So not surprisingly then, golden wing warblers like to have a forested edge nearby, uh, typically within 250 feet. So you can see this example in this stand, there's even a row of trees left, and this increases uh, the amount of forested edge available to golden wing warblers that may occupy the stand once regeneration occurs after a year or two. Okay, also adjusting the harvest unit shape can increase the amount of edge, uh, increase the edge to area ratio. Uh, now in the Appalachians, when, you're, when we're dealing with uh, a lot of topography, slope, aspect, uh, soils, and accessibility, you know, this just occurs inherently. You're not going to be able to cut a nice uh, square block. So these uh, shapes right here, these harvests, are typical of what we have in the Appalachian, and that works great for golden wing warblers. Um, for the size, we can't really give you a good recommendation on what size harvest golden wing warblers will use because given the right structural features, golden wing warblers will use almost uh, any size of stand. So uh, we're just, we're not comfortable in, in giving one, you know, cookie cutter size to use. The edge itself can also be manipulated to improve the habitat value of the stand. Uh, feathered edges that promote gradual transition from older forest into uh, timber harvest are recommended, not just for golden wings, but for other wildlife as well. And this gradual transition will provide the stratified vegetation uh, that golden wing warblers prefer. prefer. And if you have these uh, feathered edges, you may actually have golden wing warblers occupying these stands a little bit earlier, you know, earlier than those four years than they would because here suddenly they have shrubs, they have saplings sort of in that edge that they can start using. 
Okay, so golden warblers select and breed in, in young forest habitats that really contain a patchy or heterogeneous, I knew I would mess that, patchy environment that promotes both horizontal and vertical structure. A lot of heterogeneity in there. And what we mean by that is really just a mix of residual trees, uh, saplings, shrubs, forbs, grasses, and bare ground, but not the domination of any one of those. They like this patch, patchwork of all these different uh, structural features. Okay, now I'm back to the importance of canopy trees. Uh, but this time I'm going to focus on the residuals that are retained within the harvested stand. If no trees are retained, golden warblers will largely be restricted to the forested edges of a timber harvest. So retaining an appropriate number of residual trees has been an effective management tool uh, to increase the number of breeding territories. Uh, here's a very uh, simple example of including reserve islands where you can leave these large blocks of trees within the stand uh, for golden wing warblers to use. Without these blocks, of course, this, this is a new harvest, so it still needs a couple years to regenerate, but without these blocks, golden wing warblers, you know, territory might be along this edge, maybe over here on this edge, another territory, but, you know, the interior of the timber harvest stand would not be used. Now, with these uh, islands retained, you may have another golden wing warbler over on this side as well, using those canopy trees to use for foraging and singing perches. But the best way to retain trees is through scattering them evenly throughout the harvest, as shown here. So this way, golden wing warblers can, uh, territories can be set up throughout the harvest. Uh, in this case, you know, we might have golden wing warblers setting up a territory here and not rely on the forest edge at all. Of course, we recognize that this may not be feasible uh, as tree mortality from wind or sun or other factors may be high if, if trees are just left you know, individually scattered throughout, throughout the stand. And again, this is where each land manager and forester is the expert on, on the conditions at that site is, is really needed to fine tune these guidelines. And, and many of the foresters in Pennsylvania who experience uh, high tree mortality now use these mini islands or mini clumps of trees to help reduce tree mortality in their, in their timber harvest. So having these little mini clumps scattered throughout the harvest then would, would boost the number of breeding territories of golden wing warblers. And this is really a perfect example of the importance of uh, residual trees in a study from Wisconsin. On the, the example on the left clearly has very few residual trees retained throughout the timber harvest. And those polygons represent territories of birds over two seasons. So the white polygon is for 2007. You can see on the left there were two males uh, in that stand in 2007. Then in 2008, there was one male golden wing warbler. Well, this stand that has very few residuals, those territories were largely restricted to the edges. I've been told there was one tree right in the middle here that the bird would jump to to sing from. Uh, but they're largely restricted to the edges of that timber harvest. So, you know, there are no birds that can set up territories out here in this portion of the stand. And uh, these birds, could, did not even breed in these seasons. They could not attract mates. So nesting success or reproductive output was zero. Now, if we compare that to the example on the right where there are a high number of residual trees retained, we can see we have higher densities of birds in those stands. Each year, uh, those stands supported five to six breeding males. Uh, these males did breed and attract mates, and they had relatively high nesting success. And they were not restricted to the forested edges. You can see, you know, some of these polygons, as, as shown here, is right in the middle, uh, right in the middle of that stand. So again, this bird is not relying on that mature forest edge on, you know, on the uh, outside of that timber harvest. And these stands were, were fairly close in proximity to one another. So uh, it was clearly, you know, those residual trees allowed birds to use more habitat. Again, these are social creatures. They do not want to be isolated uh, and by themselves. And another thing I want to point out is that when we talk about uh, golden wing warblers, these are a, 
a forest bird that tend to use early successional habitat for their breeding habitat. But a mature forest edge around these stands is still really important, not only to provide you know, the canopy trees on the edge for foraging and singing, but the birds will move through that forest habitat um, in the afternoons. We're still trying to understand why the birds are moving. Sometimes they're moving uh, through these areas, maybe for extra pair copulations with other birds. Then also once the post-breeding season occurs, once they're finished nesting and they're moving through the landscape with their young, they're moving through forested habitats. Uh, they may use patches of early successional habitat throughout that time, but they still need high forest cover uh, that they're going to move through. Okay, so when we're referring to uh, these residual trees to retain in the timber harvest, of course, uh, we're talking about these healthy residuals that have a lot of leaves on them because, remember, uh, Goldman warblers like to forage in all strata of the vegetation. So when they're in the trees, they're foraging uh, for those caterpillar larvae in, in the leaves of these trees. So a healthy residual would be uh, that example in the middle there. And then there was the size of the residuals. Oh, I didn't even, I'm not sure if I even mentioned to retain our, our guideline to retain 10 to 15 trees per acre. And we recommend that the majority of those be, uh, or most of those be greater than nine inches in DBH. And the reason why we we say that is when we look at the stands where golden wing warblers were present, we see that uh, the majority of the residuals were greater than nine inches uh, in DBH. So, you know, if we want to really break down that pie chart, we would say that maybe four to six, at least four to six of the residual trees should be greater than 15 inches in DBH, maybe three to five in the nine to 15 inch class classification, and then maybe two or three uh, in that smaller four to nine inch DBH. But there's certainly a range of these residual sizes that can be retained uh, for golden wing warblers in those timber harvest stands. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind, of course, are not just the trees, but the, the shrubs and then those saplings that are growing. And often, again, in these timber harvests, these occur inherently within a stand. Uh, due to spatial variation in soil hydrology, you'll have these patchy conditions, so you won't have the domination of one thing uh, across the whole stand. And um, again, Goldman warblers use this mix, where they want to see a mix of shrubs, saplings, uh, those residual trees, but nothing too thick to shade out the herbaceous cover. And these shrubs and saplings provide foraging habitat and nesting cover for Goldman warblers. Uh, you can see the, the rubus, the blackberry there, uh, is one of those key shrubs that golden warblers uh, will forage in quite a bit. That's a prime example of the perfect shrub to have growing in uh, the timber harvest. And in most cases, you know, underplanting is not necessary because seedling and shrub density from natural genera regeneration is adequate. And so the numbers I present here are, are not as important for foresters or land managers um, working in timber harvest and regenerating stands, but they may be instrumental when uh, restoring or reclaiming those edges of those uh, strip mines. So just another visual example, the uh, stand on the top left there is just too thick. Uh, it's reached that stem exclusion or pole stage, so there's uh, too much canopy cover and the uh, shrub and certainly the herbaceous layer will be getting shaded out. So that's too thick for golden wing warblers. The stand on the bottom left is just simply too young. There's not enough structure yet for the golden wing warblers. And then that stand on the right is sort of that Goldilocks just right stand where we have uh, the regeneration of the shrubs. There's still some herbaceous component, uh, saplings. And in this stand on the right, it's a prime example of if you retain those uh, residual trees, you can have cerulean warblers occupying the same stand that golden wing warblers occupy. And in fact, in some of our, in about 12 stands in uh, the northeast Pennsylvania area, we had that exact occurrence. We had golden wing warblers and uh, cerulean warblers occupying the same stand. So cerulean warblers, obviously, uh, 
maybe on the edge or in the areas of the harvest that had the higher um, residual basal area. Okay, so we've talked about herbaceous cover and so this ground cover uh, and other forbs are particularly important for golden warblers because they're used as a nesting substrate. This component can be provided through properly retiring uh, skid trails, haul roads, and log landings. Expensive native seed is not necessary because uh, forbs used by nesting golden wing warblers like goldenrod are wind dispersed and or are available in the seed bank. Uh, we suggest that you use a minimal maintenance approach that will provide the herbaceous cover used by golden wing warblers and certainly this cover is used by grouse, turkey, fawn, um, all kinds of wildlife. So uh, just simply grade roads and landings to reduce erosion, feed with plants that establish quickly but will not dominate permanently, avoid using non-native perennial cool season grasses such as red top or fescue, orchard grass, because these will actually outcompete those forbs uh, used by nesting golden wing warblers. Here's a list of a good mix that managers could use. Uh, another forester we talked to simply uses uh, 50 pounds per acre of annual ryegrass. That would be another option. Uh, mulch with wheat or oat straw to prevent introduction of those undesirable plants whose seeds are often found in mulch hay. Okay, so this will provide that herbaceous cover uh, and and stabilize, right, so we reduce erosion. Okay, and then retaining down wood and, and unique features throughout uh, the timber stands and throughout the landscape will certainly help uh, break up the microtopography and maintain patchiness of vegetation. Of course, downed wood is also in, in, has um, clear nutrient cycling and, and wildlife benefits as well. Uh, establishment of some shrubs uh, like rubus, which I just mentioned as important uh, foraging substrate for goldwing warblers. Establishment of those shrubs will be promoted by, by leaving harvested treetops where songbirds will perch and deposit seeds. Forgot to. But of course there are, are tools in addition to timber management uh, that will both enhance and extend the suitability of these uh, early successional stands for golden wing warblers. Uh, for example, when deer populations approach or exceed carrying capacity, uh, they, can they can inhibit a regeneration. So in these cases, increased deer harvest uh, via hunting or deer deterrent fencing may be necessary. Uh, fire is another important tool uh, that may be used to prepare stands for regeneration or it can be used to extend suitability by maintaining that early successional structure and maintaining that herbaceous component. Okay, and then we'll be integrating our um, Goldman Warbler guidelines with those provided with the American Woodcock BMP because there's clearly tremendous potential to manage for both and many other species as well in areas of overlapping ranges. And in fact, this year we conducted uh, woodcock surveys at some of the same timber harvest stands uh, where we surveyed golden wing warblers. Uh, we found that woodcock were using, of course, many of the same stands and selecting a lot of the same features that golden wing warblers are selecting. Uh, however, some management, keep in mind that some management activities for woodcock, uh, like removing all the residuals, uh, do not provide habitat for golden wing warblers. In fact, in, in one of the woodcock management areas, uh, in north central PA, where all canopy trees were removed, no golden wing warblers returned uh, after they removed those trees, even though they were breeding in those same stands uh, in previous years. The golden wing warblers, who really, if you're creating habitat for golden wing warblers, you need to keep in mind <coughs> those residual trees as well. Okay, so what's next for this project? Well, I'm continuing to analyze the second field season of data. I will use that to uh, modify, revise, and add to our first draft so that we can provide printed copies to uh, anyone who's requested it and uh, you know, distribute it to land managers and foresters. And we will also provide online access to the BMP. We've handed out 
Uh, we've provided the handout of the BMP basics to you today. Uh, we've had a number of training workshops, three of them throughout the state of Pennsylvania where we had participants uh, from, of course, PA, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and West Virginia, uh, where we have discussed these guidelines with them as well. And we've actually gone out to uh, Timber Harvest to really get our hands dirty and see what it's all about so everybody could get some really great uh, a visual understanding, better than what my pictures can provide for you here today, a better uh, understanding of what uh, golden wing warblers are using. So uh, with that, I just want to briefly conclude with the notion that um, I just want to wrap up sort of what Jeff and I have discussed together. This notion that habitat previously used by golden wing warblers uh, is becoming increasingly scarce. Uh, so golden wing warbler populations will continue to decline unless immediate action occurs. And the most important contribution to conservation then will be to maximize the amount of young forests that can be sustainably managed in areas devoid of blue wing warblers and where golden wing warblers are a priority. And of course, to do this, timber management will be an essential approach uh, to meeting the early successional and population goals uh, needed in golden wing warbler conservation. So with that, I just want to thank Barry Isaacs for inviting us today uh, to reach out to all of all of you, if you're all still there, <laughs> and to, to thank the participants, of course, for listening in and attending, and we'd be happy to address any questions at this time. Thank you. At this time, if anyone has a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Please record your name when prompted. Again, please press star 1 to ask a question. One moment, please. While we're waiting for a question to come in through the operator, we have had several questions come in through the Q&A, and I'm going to read one of those out and ask our speakers to respond to that. Uh, the first one is from an NRCS conservationist that is located in the northeast Wisconsin Marinette County focus area, and the question is what can that person do at the local area? And would it be appropriate to try and form a golden warbler working group there? My, my answer to that would be that uh, this individual can contact me if, uh, if they'd like directly at uh, IUP. It's just my last name, Larkin, at IUP.edu. But I encourage that person to uh, get in contact with uh, Amber Roth. She is... Um, is really a, uh, an important player in golden wing warbler uh, habitat management in that part uh, of the of the birds breeding range for sure. Yeah, we should have provided our emails. We do have a question from the phone lines. Jody Reisner, your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Okay, thank you. Huh? Um, yeah, that was me with the question. So who is it? who's that Amber Roth? Amber Roth is actually a Ph.D. student at Michigan Tech, but she is uh, also a um, Wildlife Management Institute, uh, American Woodcock, um, concert, I guess, conservation planner or contractor. Her, but, but her background is uh, certainly golden wing warbler. Uh, she... She um, has extensive experience both on her master's and her Ph.D. working with uh, golden wing warbler ecology and conservation in the upper Midwest. Um, she, uh, she is one of those, one of those folks that uh, uh, firmly embraces the, the uh, integration of, of golden wing warbler and uh, American woodcock and other young forest-dependent species. And how do I get a hold of her? Uh, I can uh, try to. If, if well, could you email me and I can uh, get you in direct contact with her? Sure. Was your email on the? I didn't see your email on the slides. I'm um, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to give it to everybody again. It's just my last name, Larkin, L-A-R-K-I-N, and that's at, and then it's I-U-P, 
uh, Indiana University, Pennsylvania, IUP dot edu. So it's Larkin at IUP dot edu. Thank you. You're very welcome. And if anybody would like to contact me as well, I apologize that we didn't have our, our email information on there. My email is simply my name, although I guess that's not so simple, M-A-R-J-A dot, and then my last name, B-A-K-E-R-M-A-N-S, S is in Sam is the last letter, at I-U-P dot E-D-U. Anybody would like to follow up with a question with us uh, at a later point in time, please feel free to do so. Thank you. As a reminder, if anyone has a question or a comment, you may press star 1. Again, star 1 if anyone has a question or a comment. Okay. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to follow up with some of the questions that have come on online. And I think, uh, Jeff, this was during your presentation. You had a graph of forest age class, and there was an area that was called other zones. Uh, it was in purple, and I think the question is, can you describe other zones in that graph? And to follow up uh, with that question, uh, is there a minimum size opening or patch cut that is needed to get the desired habitat? Okay, I'll uh, I'll start with the, the easiest one to answer, and that is um, every forest district uh, has some unique stand types that they code that they all lump together. I do not particularly know what uh, that particular coding was for Delaware State Forest. Um, uh, sorry that I can't provide that information. Now, with respect to the <laughs> the size of a cut, um, this is this is a particularly uh, challenging question because, um, as Maria stated in her talk, um, you know there isn't we we have never really found uh, a what is too big, a what is too small, cut and dry scenario. What what is clear is that the species will occur in relatively small areas, a couple acres in size, if in fact those areas are in close proximity to other uh, young forest types. Um, if if you have a patchwork of young forest types, maybe that are small in scale, uh, you can have birds. Certainly, I have seen upwards to 40 to 70 acre clear cuts uh, in Sproul State Forest that are only maybe four or five miles from a lot of golden wing warblers, a thriving population, and uh, and not had a single bird in that particular stand. And it was because it was isolated uh, completely by nothing more than, you know, 80 to 100 year old mature forest. So uh, you know you could go down the road and, and find uh, and find a little bit closer to these core breeding populations. You can find a clear cut that was uh, or a shelter wood cut that was much smaller in size that would have had golden wings and and I've seen them in bigger clear cuts uh, or or shelter wood cuts that had the appropriate dimensions. Uh, the thing the thing to, to to take into account here is that um, the species. Breeding ecology, uh, the habitat is uh, it, it's pretty particular um, in that it needs these these primary features. It needs that forest landscape. It needs those residual trees or basal area, whatever you like to whatever metric you like to work in. It needs that well developed shrub layer. It needs that herbaceous layer. You know, it's just not going to be. Uh, a one characteristic um, stand level, say, say, for example. It's just not going to be a within stand characteristic uh, answer to any of these questions. You have to think about this from a multi-spatial scale. You have to think about it from a landscape perspective, the stand perspective, that within stand perspective. All of those variables have to come into play. And I hope that, um, and I think Maria said that she's put the BMP basics uh, online, it's available for you to download until our uh, our bigger document is made available, which will be sometime um, in early December. Um, that and then it'll be followed by one that's uh, in integration with uh, the Woodcock uh, BMP, so a combined Young Forest BMP. 
But, uh, again, I, I wish I had that magic, you know, number and range that I could provide folks. And it, and it is, you know, I'd be lying if I said this was the first time we've been asked this question. We have been asked this question a lot. Uh, right, uh, right up there ranking with, uh, what is the perfect residual basal area, uh, to be left in clearings. And I think I see, uh, let's see, I think I see a question here now that's, um, Shauna Shaw's question about uh, how wide of a feathered edge should it be. Uh, also, is there uh, tree? Oh, predator perches in regard to residual trees being left in clearings. The predator perch is one of these uh, phenomena that I have um, yet to find a scientific article that uh, suggested this is the case. Yes, I have seen predators sitting in perches in clear cuts. Um, but I also know that uh, that these species co-evolved with each other, and there were always uh, you could see that tornado slide, lots of snags and standing uh, and standing broken off trees for which predators could perch in. Um, if you provide all of those other characteristics, if you provide a good mix of herbaceous shrub, you know, vertical structure, horizontal structure. Uh, this is uh, it's not something that you need to be concerned about. I'll go out there and say that. The other thing is um, the vast majority of predation uh, for golden wing warblers from a nesting perspective is not uh, raptors. It's uh, it's actually things like chipmunks and and uh, garter snakes and black rat snakes. Those are your main primary um, predators in those systems. Um, not going to be uh, predators. You need not worry about the predator perch. Okay. <clears throat> While we wait, we've got a number more questions. I'll go ahead and uh, the next question is from Philip uh, Barber. He goes, what is the large gap in East Tennessee? This was on the distribution maps you showed. Also, have you considered recommending Virginia wild rye as a plant in a uh, recommended list of plants? We we leave the recommended list of herbaceous plants to be um, to be up to each state's. Uh, I mean, we even have that varies even within our, within Pennsylvania. We have uh, DC and our Bureau of Forestry, who um, you know that agency has a completely different mix of herbaceous species that they plant uh, uh, on their log landings and their skid row, uh, skid trails and such. Um, that differs from uh, the game commission's mix. Uh, the the thing I want to point out there is that a lot of the species we want are going to be in the seed bank. Um, you, you you just need to stabilize that site, uh, particularly if if there's any kind of potential for erosion. Uh, some of the best sites we've seen in these timber harvests are sites that uh, were stabilized with some kind of annual herbaceous cover. And now they just look like, uh, you know, a goldenrod, um, basically a goldenrod dominated patch. And, and that's, uh, that's really what we should be shooting for. Okay. Next question. Can there but, be too much? I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, uh, but, but, but any, any state should be working, um, collectively within, you know, within its, within its own state and, and getting its opinion, getting opinions from various, uh, various folks to, as to what they want to, uh, to plant. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, next question is, can there be too much down wood left on a site? For example, if a clearing is taking place in a conifer stand where cut trees and branches leave a lot of res residual wood covering on the ground? Yeah. Um, Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't have much experience in in the in the realm of uh, recover uh, stands that are uh, conifer stands that are recovering from or regenerating from timber harvest. But um, my personal opinion would be no. That I don't think that there is too much downwoody material that you can have. Uh, that will that'll sort its, itself out. What I think is really interesting is that, um, you know, 
again, a lot of these disturbances that historically the species would have occurred, would have, would have been found in, um, would have not had us being really nice housekeepers. It, it was definitely not pretty. Um, so I, I would not concern uh, concern yourself with, with how much woody vegetation you leave. And leaving that down wood will inhibit deer browse and mm -hmm. help regeneration of the stand as well. Yeah, that that we do know. We've seen, you know, there's there's evidence of that in uh, areas with, with other ungulates that uh, down woody material and debris, debris actually provide some refugia in uh, the regeneration of woody vegetation. Okay, next question. What do we have to do in order to avoid blue blue wing warbler from moving into the managed uh, gold wing warbler uh, areas or habitat? Well, there's, there's, there's nothing you can do post uh, treatment. You just have to be uh, very careful in where you're going to um, spend your efforts and your time. You want to identify, again, those landscapes. We, we, we try to dis we tried to give you a starting point, the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group, with all of those folks getting together for three days in, uh, in August of 2010 and using the best available knowledge we had out there to identify and delineate the focal conservation areas for each date and province of Golden Wing Warbler's breeding range. Um, we took into account Blue Wing Warbler um, uh, occupancy in that particular exercise when we delineated those those conservation areas. Um, you know, there's going to be a little bit of on the ground work you want to do, and, and you don't need to do this on your own. Uh, remember that uh, just about every state has a breeding bird atlas that has been done. Uh, every state has a, a state ornithologist that can help point you in the direction of known breeding golden wing warbler populations. Get yourself familiar with the distribution of both golden wing and blue wing warbler populations and work in those areas that, uh, that you have the greatest chance of success. But, um, you know, I should point out that it's not like the blue wing warbler is, uh, you know, thriving and is in the clear itself. It's, it's definitely a species that is, is, that is experiencing some problems of its own. Um, so early successional work that is done outside of the Golden Wing Warbler Conservation Area, so long as it does not promote expansion of golden, uh, blue wings into Golden Wing Warbler areas, is, uh, is certainly appropriate. But, but again, this is, uh, this is geared more toward Golden Wings because Golden Wings are much more in, the, in jeopardy these days. Okay. Next question. My concern using power line right-of-ways would be use of chemicals on these alleys. How does that affect habitat quality slash management? Our, I guess maybe the question is directed as use of chemicals during the uh, actual um, breeding season. Um, certainly, certainly we have our own experience with that. Just within the last two years, we we have had the unfortunate experience of coming down some of our study areas, some of our power line right-of-ways that we've been studying over a number of years only to hear the sounds of motorized backpack sprayers and quads uh, spraying large amounts of herbicide during the middle of the breeding season, actually drenching some of our uh, known nests that we had. And um, I mean, it's, it's a concern from the standpoint of uh, if work is done during the breeding season. Um, we need to do a better job at Communicating with utility companies and get them to, to better understand uh, better understand the the one fact that we can't avoid, and that is that um, actions on power lines, uh, even if they're sinks, uh, may may be contributing to to the species decline. We, and, and we have to be a little bit more effective at, at managing these areas. The reality is, um, what happens. When, when and if the species does become listed as an endangered species, those power companies, those utility right-of-ways become uh, incredible points of regulation, even more so than what you have now. So it's, uh, it's something that we all need to do a little bit better job at communicating with these companies. 
Okay, speaking of uh, listed species, the next question says, are there conflicts with golden wing warblers and bog turtle habitat restoration management? Mm -hmm. Especially since bog turtle habitat, you know, they discourage trees and shrubs. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, it, it certainly it certainly is, um, is certainly something that one needs to consider and prioritize within their given landscape, but... Uh, I think the the other thing we need to to consider is that um, where these two habitat types come together, uh, you can provide some habitat for golden wing warblers. You know, the, the the trick that we're all facing these days is how do we manage the landscapes we have um, for the large number of imperiled uh, species that that we're finding ourselves being responsible, you know, having to be responsible stewards for. Um, Indiana bats, uh, another one that you know we could probably have a whole another uh, whole another question uh, answer session just dedicated to how golden wing warbler and Indiana bat management uh, tie into uh, to each other and the potential for conflict between those two. But I think again we just have to be thinking about the landscapes that we're working in and the, and the 